Kit, I've been super excited to talk to you today about nature-based therapy, particularly how it can be used with working with trauma because so many writers I'm seeing have got habits of procrastination, creative blocks that I sense have their roots in some form of trauma that happens. So I'm, I'm really keen to dive into that. But I'd love to start with with your origin story. So you're a nature-based therapist, but how did how did your path lead there? Yes, I love that. The birthing of of story and, and everything starts with a story and it's like planting a seed um, and, and how we grow. And I, and I think the origins of my story go back to, well, originally it's really about we are nature. We're not separate from the natural world. And so when we are birthed into this world, we are part of nature. And that goes back to indigenous worldviews. And on my paternal side is Wampanoag. And I guess I've always had a very deep connection to my indigenous heritage. And from a very young age, I played a lot in nature. I spent so much time in nature. In Vancouver, where I grew up, our back door, we were climbing trees, mud cakes, picking blackberries skating on ponds in winter, building igloos and snowmen in our backyards. We used to have a steep driveway. We used to sled down in the snow. So we were basically growing up um, in the 70s and 80s. We were just outside um, always. We didn't have clocks or watches or phones. And so we just came in a new dinner would be on the table when, when the sun went down and that was kind of nature was at clock. And so I think for me, I always had that deep connection to the natural world, but where it became, I guess, a healing modality for me is when I moved to Australia, I was unexpected and I was uprooted from my home country and came to Australia with my mum and three siblings unexpectedly and unknowingly and for me, connecting to nature gave me a sense of connection and belonging into mm. a new country, a new land. And I think every opportunity I got, I tried to connect to the natural world, whether it was going to local botanical gardens or swimming in the local lake. You know, we used to ride our bikes around a lot. And, and what I noticed from this experience was wherever I went, all through my teenage and adult life where I've traveled a lot and been and lived in different countries is that I always had to connect to nature first because um, nature gave me a sense of anchoring connection and belonging and it made me feel safe that is so important and I'm so glad that you shared it Kit this idea of being uprooted, but already having that practice of being able to connect with nature, because I think that can be a place that those of us who, oh, that's probably my ancestors coming in. <gasps> that can be a real place of those of us who have experienced trauma we've experienced that uprooting we don't have that sense of safety and we don't have a habit yet instilled in us of a place that we can go and have that deep healing connection i know that you've written in one of your blog posts that that those sort of formative childhood years if they are spent in nature that that can be so vital so it's really making me think you kind of have already had that relationship instilled in you. So you were able to go back to it when you had that uprooting experience. But it's making me think of a lot of the writers in my audience where we have that innate drive for connection, but it's... Um, it's a dysfunctional drive. We're trying to connect possibly in areas that we're not going to receive that connection. I can see you nodding. Can you can you talk a little mm. bit more about that for someone who's like, I'm I don't feel safe, I don't feel connected, and I'm I'm trying to sort of get connection through my work, but it's not happening. Yeah, and look at it's the same 
so for, for na- if you see nature as part of us and nature is part of our extended family we are nature and everything in nature is family it's all about relationships and it's all about developing rapport and relationships and deep connection and when we liken that to you're trying to go out and get connection now but liken it to someone you meet when you've got a best friend or someone you've grown up in your early childhood and you deep build that deep connection and rapport when you see them it's like yeah it was just like yesterday you're not going to have that same re- relationship and connection with someone you've just met an hour ago so if we're trying to connect to nature now and we're wanting that same relationship like you want the same relationship with the person you met an hour ago as the one that you've had for many years mm. you just can't get that the same as the, the same as with nature if you develop that relationship with nature for many many years and it's instilled in you that relationship will be so much easier to attain in in the present moment. So you're not trying to connect, you just connect. It's the same with our friendships, long-term and short-term. There's no difference, if that makes sense. Yeah, I love that analogy. It really does make sense. What it's bringing to mind, Kit, is... Um, So let's say we either didn't have that relationship with nature growing up, or perhaps we did have that relationship, but we lost touch with it, which is, which is possibly more relevant to my case. I experienced a sense of it it calling me back, but I, I'm also seeing people who don't have that connection with nature are feeling that call because if we look at the world today, people are wanting to slow down. They're sort of seeing themselves on their devices and living a fast paced life, but they're wanting something different. And I sort of sense that this is the call and maybe it's an ancestral call. It's the slowness of our ancestors kind of coming through our coming through our genes and that collective unconscious to to remind us of a place that we've forgotten which was slower you know you talked about living according to nature's clock which is so gorgeous so i want to bring this conversation towards the the people in my audience the writers the creative souls the creative professionals who are trying to express, trying to make connection with the world through their art, but they might be struggling for some, for some reason. And I have a sense that some of these struggles do have their roots in trauma. And I'm eager to explore how we can use nature to help, to help heal that. So first of all, it might be they've got creative blocks or they might be procrastinating or they might be reenacting patterns of rejection. So I'd love for you, first of all, Kit, if that feels right for you, to just explain what some of those patterns of trauma might be within the context of being a professional, being a creative, like your understanding of how those, how we might, those symptoms might show up, so to speak. Mm. Yeah, as you're talking, I'm reflecting on what nature does best. And what nature does is it returns us back to our authentic self, our authenticity. And so when we are birthed, we are our authentic self. And then our life experiences shape who we are and what we become. But we're always our authentic self. But then what society does is we put identities and we attach ego to our authentic self. Then we no longer are our authentic self and we become far away from our authenticity. And I think that starts in early childhood through our education system. It's also through the experiences that we have with our peers. Mm. And, you know, we become removed from our authentic self and we start to lose the concept of who we are. And that's where the disconnection from nature comes in and who we need to be. 
And, you know, when we look at social media and we look at marketing and we look at capitalism and consumerism, or we look at the expectations of our parents, especially for creatives, oh, you can't make a living out of art, you can't make a living out of music, you'll never be able to make a living out of being a writer, you need to go and study law, you need to go and do medicine. And so we have expectations on who we need to be, but when you take away creativeness from a human, you're removing them from their authentic self. Because authenticity is create creation we're creators and so we're no longer being the person we are we're kind of doing what we think other people think we should be doing or who other people think we should be and trauma comes in many forms and so when we look at what is trauma trauma is an experience that gets us to be removed from our authentic self or it challenges us around our own self-worth and our own connection and sense of belonging as well. So when we respond, if we have a traumatic e event, for example, um, just say we went through childhood being um, bullied at school and so that hinders our self-worth and we start to feel that we're not worthy of friends or no one likes us or I'm no good at anything and these narratives form in our minds and so this goes back to our self-belief and so when that's hindered we're always going to have some sense of I can't do this or what if it's not good enough and we get writer's block or we get creator's block because we're thinking again about the judgment of other people reading the writing. Are we writing for ourselves or are we writing for others? Mm -hmm. And so when we write from a place of authenticity and we're writing from, you know, the gut brain, our intuition, and not from our logical brain, nature is really good at connecting us to our sixth sense which is our intuition and it gets us into the body and, and with trauma and stress responses you know we go into fight flight freeze and fawn and it's really important to understand what stress response we go into and how is that represented in our behaviors and our actions so I specialize working in addictions for over 20 years I've worked in drug and alcohol addiction. At the moment I work in gambling addiction. And we look at stress responses and we look at what are the triggers and what, you know, people reaching out for, for alcohol on a Friday night to soothe themselves during the week because they've been in a job that they've absolutely hated. And then Friday night everyone goes out and gets drunk, which is quite normal and accepted in our society. That that's just what you do but it's not a healthy behavior and it has implications as well um you know or do we withdraw do we go into fawn to become socially disconnected and socially isolated and do we stop talking to other people or do we flight do we run away from all our problems and again do we engage in risky behaviors and so it's identifying what are our stress responses and how do we deal with them? And nature's um, a beautiful method, nature connection, to be able to be in the body and just return to our authentic self and our authentic state. Mm. So many things here, Kit, that are just absolute gems. Let me go through them in order. I felt really, really moved when you talked about being born in that pure, authentic state and then we start to layer on identity and ego and we lose that sense of who we truly are. 
But then when you said when creativity is taken away from us, I was like, oh, and the two seem connected because birth is just this unbelievable creative process. Like it's such a powerful expression. And it, it makes me feel that's why we have this inherent urge to express, to create, like it's in our nature. So if that's taken away, it's kind of like our sort of main natural urge is removed. How, how can we be an authentic self? So I'm curious what your thoughts are in terms of how, and, and I want to talk about those different stress responses, but let's first of all come back to this. If we're in this place of having been birthed, like having been at the center of a creative act, and then our own innate desire to express, to create is taken away from us, as often happens, you know, you mentioned education. How might that start to play out? Because the body is so intelligent, it's always trying to heal itself. But unless we're aware, it's just going to keep sort of playing out, playing out, playing out. So can you give us a bit of an explanation about how we can be sort of caught in a cycle where we're just reenacting and we're reenacting, but we're not moving through perhaps that initial trauma of having creativity taken away from us? Yeah, and when we create, we release emotions or we move emotions in the body. So emotion means emotion, energy in motion. And so when we suppress emotion, it creates mental illness, it creates physical illness, spiritual illness, and we become stuck. And that's part of procrastination. We become stuck. And I think the thing with um, creativity, it's, you know, when we're going back to the education system, it's not that we can't be creative and we can't because it's so suppressed. We're working mainly with the left side of the brain, not a lot with the right side of the brain, which is our creativity, our problem solving, our intuition, all of that has been left aside once we enter the education system. And what happens is that, you know, I don't know if you remember, but when I did art class, I grew up with a narrative that I'm not creative because I got graded and I got compared to. Now, creativity is basically a result of our authenticity. We show mm -hmm. our authentic self through our creative ways. So we're being judged on our authenticity. We're being compared on our authenticity. We're being graded. Yes, you pass, you fail. And so we start to question our worth based on our creativity and this judgment and worth. And this doesn't play out just in art class, but this plays out in the whole of all our life, whether it be the jobs we choose to do, our relationships we choose to be in, the food we choose to eat and how we care for our bodies. You know, whether we move, exercise or whether we don't. So a lot of what I work with is a holistic health model and it looks at the eight dimensions of wellness and the interconnectedness of the eight dimensions of wellness. And how when one becomes out of balance, the rest become out of balance as well. And that's similar for the Native American medicine wheel. Mm. Let's dive into this idea. I mean, it, it's great. I love that you're really helping people understand, okay, if we've been judged for our creativity, our authenticity has been judged because that creative act is just the pure expression of our authenticity. So we're now, we've now got this, um, this trauma, this traumatic relationship with our authentic self. We've learned to judge it. We've learned to compare ourselves to others. So you mentioned earlier this idea of the stress response and you, you talked about it in the context of the addicts that you work in. 
Let's go a little bit more into that because I think what can happen is we're in, we're embarking on a creative act because that urge is still sort of trying to come up. It's like that seed. It's it's you know it's trying to germinate, but because of our response to authenticity that we've learned, you know, not now, not good enough. I'm scared of my authentic self. So what might be some of the stress responses that occur to someone who who's trying to embark on a creative act if that makes sense yeah well you've got the the flight which is running away so you know the one diverting to other activities so you know i'll do this and i guess that's where procrastination comes in yes because you're sort of it's, it's making me think, especially if the procrastination has like a physical element, you're sort of getting up from the computer and you're 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 going off you're going off somewhere else. So you're sort of almost reenacting that flight. You're running you're running away from your work in progress. Yes, absolutely. And then you've got the freeze, mm. and the freeze is just that's the writer's block or the creative block. It's just not moving. You're not even at the desk. You're not even sitting in your creative space. Yeah. And and also what's dropping in for me, Kit, is, and this is something that I've become aware of myself, the way that I am with myself in that moment can be hugely informative because in the past, I've had people respond to me being in free state with a kind of what's wrong with you, you know, come on, so sort yourself out. And so my healing journey very much um, stagnated because I had that self-awareness to know, say, that I was procrastinating or that I was freezing, but I didn't know how to take care of myself in that moment to help me move through that moment. So every every way that I responded to myself just made me more stressed. Mm -hmm. So I'd love for you to speak. So we've got the flight, which is I'm running away from my computer because my work in progress is terrifying the hell out of me. Freeze response, I'm not even getting there. Like I'm so frozen, I'm just completely procrastinating. Um, the fight So we've got f fight, yeah. So what- Getting angry at yourself. Or you could be getting yeah. angry at others, so blaming other people for you yeah. not being able to to do your work or to be creative. That's great. What about the fawn? How might the fawn play out in this scenario? And so fawn, again, is that bringing on the self-doubt and really kind of curling back into the fetus position of surrendering and sometimes when people get to that state some people leave creativity and say I'm it's just not for me they leave the authentic self and they go into doing perhaps a job or a career or something else and I've seen it's really interesting one of the things I ask when I'm working with people that have a dependency or an addiction what are you creative at? Where is your creativity? Mm. All the time, I used to play music. I used to write. I love to draw. And so the work I do is I invite them to re-engage in that. As we're breaking this down, Kit, I'm sitting here with this real understanding of, oh my gosh, with the creative act, we're simply just wanting to come back to being ourselves. And yet there's a huge disconnect because we want to be ourselves and yet we've been programmed to be terrified of being ourselves. Like what, what a tricky position to be in. And then not only are we terrified of being ourselves, but we're then giving ourselves a hard time because we don't realise. We don't realise that at the crux of it is, yes, you want to create, you want to write a book, but what that's doing is it's triggering your fear that you're afraid to be your authentic self, and then you're giving yourself a hard time. So mm -hmm. this cycle just goes 
round and round. You know, no wonder we can get so exhausted when we're in a very fraught creative state. So, you know, open the window, open the door. We've got nature outside. So how do we start to use this beautiful nature-based therapy that, that is your work to begin that healing journey when we find ourselves in this place? Absolutely. And it's such a simple process. And the most important thing is to give yourself the time to create the time and to make the time because so often I hear I don't have the time or I don't have access to nature or mm. I don't, you know, there's always these excuses or barriers, but nature's in us and it's all around us. And my advice is to always keep it really, really simple. One of the processes that I teach to get people to connect to nature, to connect to self and to develop that that relationship with the natural world is to tap into our sensory system, tap into our, you know, sight, smell, taste, touch, and our hearing. So being in nature, even just for 20 minutes a day, what can I hear? What can I see? What can I smell, taste, touch? It might be in your front yard, your backyard. It could be in your kitchen, picking up an apple. Biting into an apple, what do you hear? A crunch. What do you smell? You can smell the apple. You can taste the apple. You can see the apple. You know, you're feeling the apple. Something so simple as engaging in fruit, which comes from the natural world, is an ancient connection activity. And it's about being in the moment, being in the body, and having appreciation for what nature's provided for you. Or it might be sitting outside in your garden and just watching a bee pollinating a flower and just observing what the bee's doing and how it's working or just noticing the wind moving the leaves and hearing the rustling of the leaves and maybe watching a couple of them fall and just seeing how nature works and just being in that moment. And you can do this, it can only take five minutes. It might take 10, you might want to take 20. I usually say to people, if I can prescribe 20 minutes of nature connection three days a week, that will ensure, you know, you're building up that mm -hmm. relationship. It's like, how often do you catch up with friends? Your social mm -hmm. connections, do you plan to catch up with friends once a week or twice a week? It's the same as developing that relationship with nature and developing that relationship with your authentic self because the two go hand in hand. Every time you connect to nature, you're connecting to your authenticity. And so what we want to do is we want to provide opportunities for connection. I love the way you're breaking it down. And it's so interesting, Kit, because even to just listen to you describing those moments of interacting with nature is, is beautiful to listen to. What's dropping in for me is, so you're, you're talking about connecting with nature is connecting to the authentic self. And it's, it's making me reflect on an experience that I had in my healing journey where I felt that call, I felt that call to find some other way of being to, that was sort of saying, you know, where you are, the pace at which you're living, it, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel right. And I knew it was nature that was calling me. But I was really resisting that call. And I suspect that part of that resistance was I was afraid to, to connect with that authentic self because I'd been taught, you know, that that authentic self is wrong. Um, and I sometimes I'd find myself going into nature and kind of just rushing through it. You know, at, at the very beginning, I was like, oh, and I'd be out in nature. And the first few experiences were just showing me I'm just so frenetic. I'm so stressed and it was so uncomfortable. So I wanted to touch on that because for some people, they, they might be like, oh, you know, 
eating an apple is in the kitchen. I've got to be, I've got to be watching TikTok at the same time because it's like, it just feels too slow or, or it just doesn't feel comfortable. Or when mm. I'm out in nature, I've got to have my headphones in and listening to music because I can't bear the silence. Mm -hmm. So can you speak to those of us who are in such a place of fear of that connection and that authenticity or in such a state of stress? that they might be resisting slowing down to have that connection or they might be finding that connection really uncomfortable. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And everything that you have described is really quite normal when we're introducing the concept of nature connection or nature-based therapy. Um, this is such a, a common part of the initial barrier to get through to be able to engage in nature connection processes is, is exactly what you've explained. And, and so there's the difference, you know, we can go out to nature and be in nature, you know, well, we're more doing in nature, you know, I'm in nature. Yeah, we're going for a walk, but you're still thinking about what you've done yesterday or what you need to do tomorrow, or you might be on your phone, you've got your headphones on or you've got your shoes on walking on the beach that there's a difference of being in nature and actually being with nature so we can be in nature or we can be with nature and being with nature is where we slow down and what it is what we've become accustomed to is distractions mm -hmm. you know we've become so when someone has a distraction and they're not able to be in that mindful moment in the body, my question is, what are you trying to distract from? And most of the time, it's an emotion that doesn't want to be felt. So my question is, what's going on in your life that you're feeling uncomfortable about? And if we look at emotions of the emotions of shame or sadness or guilt or emotions of fear. And so we have distractions. People keep busy on the computer or they overwork or they TikTok, And so it's distracting them. But I think more so now in today's age and the flooding of technology, especially since COVID and lockdowns, what's happening what's happened in those three years everything went online we were in lockdown where we couldn't even go and see other humans the face-to-face -face interactions were diminished to having to go online um you know and i think the introductions of smartphones everything's on your phone now your banking your emails your facebook instagram you know there's there's plus sides to this it means that you can go away and work out of home or you can have more family work balance you don't have to travel as far there's enhanced communication and networks but there's also a downside which contributes to the disconnection. And when people don't feel comfortable just slowing down, being in the moment, it means they're uncomfortable with themselves. Mm. I love that you mentioned that word distraction because I think that is really playing out and as you said very much exacerbated in the last three years because we've become even more in connection with our devices it's it's making me think of another aspect of your work which is that we've we've evolved with nature and what's starting to happen as we're evolving without nature you know you're saying it's not about being in nature it's being with nature so what starts to happen if we're spending more and more time and we're evolving without it and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this because we, we mentioned briefly offline when we were talking about the editing of, of this show that I don't edit it because I'm starting to watch less and less visual podcasts with those quick edits 
because it seems so unnatural to my eye. And yet many of us are getting used to things being fast, no pauses, no arms, like lots of quick, which we don't see in the natural world. So what are your thoughts about how we've evolved thus far, like in real connection with, and what is starting to happen as we're now continuing to evolve without? Mm -hmm. Uh, Yep, absolutely. And it's a really good question and it's a really important question because our biophilia is nature. And so we have, you know, evolved for thousands of years, been connected to the natural world. And Australia is just over 200 years colonised. And when we look at Aboriginal culture here, that's lived with nature for, you know, it's the longest living culture in the world, 120 thousand years um, 80,000 years in some parts 60,000 years but archaeology has found you know rock art being 120,000 years old and it's like wow and then you think well hang on a minute it's only 200 years since colonization my ancestors in in America over 400 years which isn't a long time And so when we look at our lifestyle of hunting, gathering, being very connected to the natural world, working with seasons, eating in seasons, you know, working with the natural clock of life. And then capitalism comes in and the industrial revolution comes in and progress comes in. We need to progress. What is progress? Moving faster, quicker, getting more but do we need more? And so the human body and the human psyche cannot keep up Mm. with the demands of an unnatural world. Mm. The planet can't keep up with it. And so when we look at environmental justice, it's got to be simultaneous to social justice. Everything I see that's happening with the environment and the the destruction of the natural world as we're seeing it now and the impacts it's having is having a direct impact on our society and the health and well-being of the people. The two are simultaneous. And so we are going too fast Mm -hmm. and it's having impacts, you know, despite the billions of dollars that have been put into mental health care we still have high rates of suicide we have high rates of addiction our prisons are overflowing heart disease is on the ride cardiovascular stress you know something's not working and what's not working is that our life and society is going too fast for the human being. There's too much doing and not enough being. Mm. Yeah, thank you for your thoughts on that, Kit. It's so moving for me to um, to just listen to that. I love the way that you talk about the rock art. I want to go back there because, so we got 120,000 years ago, the indigenous cultures in Australia creating art on on the wall of a rock. And then when you talked about progress, like we're, we're sort of too fast for the human body now. And again, I'm putting it into the writer's world context. We've got this impulse to just put rock art in a cave. But now when we write, we've got gatekeepers, we've got the publishing world, we've got likes, we've got how many views. So that sort of natural impulse to draw, to create, to express is being received in such a different way. That sort of natural storytelling design that we have as human beings is then being said, no, you can't come here. I'm closing this door in your face. So this sort of very strange evolutionary mismatch Mm. going on is, is my sense as I'm listening to you. Yeah, so we're telling, you know, we tell stories. So indigenous cultures tell story through art or through ceremony or through dance and through movement, which are all creative means. 
And so when we look at the Western world, the Western world views of creativity and storytelling, it's often critiqued. But you can't, crit you can't critique storytelling because you're critiquing the storyteller. And when you critique the storyteller, you're critiquing someone's spirit because mm. it's our spiritual well-being that's been hindered and our authentic self is our spiritual connection and it's our spirituality. And so that's quite harmful. It's almost like a form of emotional abuse. Mm. And that is the truth. I love that when you're saying when you critique the story, you're critiquing that soul, you're critiquing that spirit. What are your thoughts on, because this is, this is definitely something that's come up for me in my healing journey, where I realized that that sort of natural storytelling impulse, I would got into a place where I wasn't expressing my truth, I was expressing my trauma. So it sort of wasn't my soul that was speaking, but it was like my wound that was speaking. What, what are your thoughts on that, where perhaps we are expressing ourselves, but it's not coming from, if you talk, you know, that, that part of us that you said, when we're born, we're born in that pure state, but it's not coming from that pure state. It's coming possibly from the ego. It's coming possibly from the traumaed place. How can we get a sense of where we're at in that journey? And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Mm. Yeah, that's a really interesting point that you've made that when often we tell story, we're telling story of trauma or our wounds, but you know, we call that the wounded warrior. And so it's, it's a way, being able to talk about our wounds and talk about our story is a process of healing because it means that we have ownership over it. It's not owning us. It's like we've regained that authority over the wound that we're able to return to our authentic self and we've externalized that through our storytelling. Yeah, and of course, in a, in a beautiful container that can be so healing, can't it? But then if we go back to this example that we're, we're getting ownership of that wounding through telling the story, but then if someone's then critiquing it because that story's gone into, an, into a memoir and we've then sent that memoir to a literary agent and then it gets rejected. So I'm sort of seeing that very complicated process where someone may not re realize that they've they've expressed their wound and it's in this manuscript and that manuscript needs to be taken such care of and yet it goes out on submission and they don't hear anything for three months and then when they do hear something it's it's negative or maybe they never hear something so that process can be incredibly wounding what what would you suggest for someone who who might be in that in that in that situation and how they can move through it sort of you know you talked about taking the time sort of step back move through it before they then re-engage with the you know the publishing world yeah and as you're talking i see two different worlds here the publishing world is based on consumerism and capitalism it's wanting to sell a product but the story isn't a product. Mm -hmm. The story is someone's authenticity. And this is the dilemma. So my recommendation would be to self-publish. If you don't want it to become, you know, you're selling a part of your soul in, in a way when you are asking someone else to critique and edit and then publish your work and asking for validation of your story somewhat. But your story doesn't need validation. You're the only person that can validate your story. And so my question is, why does someone want to publish 
their story or their soul or their authenticity or their story? What is the intention behind that? Mm. Yeah. I think that word validation is really spot on, Kit. And I love that you've made the distinction between what happens in the publishing world where that soul story, that authentic truth is turned into a commodity and how wounding that can feel versus when you nurture that story and you validate it yourself. Let's bring that, let's bring that back now into nature because I certainly see a lot of the beautiful writing community in this place. Like I see them so hungry for that validation, so hungry for that publishing kudos. They want to go the traditional route. They don't want to self-publish because there's a sense of like, I, I need the validation. I need somebody else to say, this is, you know, this is, this story is worth something. So for people who might be like, yes, I'm in that place, how can they, how can they now begin to build that connection with nature to help them move through this process? Like if you were working with someone who you saw, yeah, they're seeking for external validation. Let's do some nature-based therapy and let's really help them with this. Mm. If they have a manicured garden at home, I would tell them to let their garden be overgrown. It's, I see so many similarities between just letting your yard nature be nature and letting weeds come up and letting things create its own ecosystem. There was actually a study done. I th was it San Francisco? It was on a bridge and they wanted to see what would happen if they didn't do anything, any maintenance of nature. You know, we have businesses, lawn mowing and garden maintenance. There's so many businesses, There's the local council will hire people to go out and keep the lawns clipped or manicured. And it's similar to publishing a book and writing, right? Mm. What happens if you just let nature be nature? And what if you didn't weed your garden? What would happen to your garden if you just let it be nature? Would it be judged by other people? Would it be need to come in and edit and weed and change it around to suit their agenda? And so if we really want to get a sense of what it's like, just let your garden overgrow. Mm -hmm. and, and that is your authentic writing. Um, and see what happens. I love this analogy. <clears throat> and actually it's it's making me come back to a moment in the conversation when you talked about distraction you talked about when you're working with an addict and you're asking them you know what are they what are they trying to distract themselves from and the concept also that you talked about emotion which is that energy in motion if we're not letting it move through you uh, I tell you why I'm making those connections because I very much come from a place of like my garden needs to be well tended so as you were describing the overgrown I could feel the part of me that's sort of coming up and 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 and, be, and having you know having a bit of a wobble and I'm just sitting here sort of just feeling that part and being reminded yes for me there's like a barrier of discomfort that I have to allow myself to move through when I'm not in this kind of perfectly manicured perfectly edited piece of writing but what's beautiful is nature has enabled me to, to, to be able to hold myself in that discomfort rather than react to that discomfort by getting out the lawnmower or, or, or like, you know, getting out, putting my editing hat on and like editing the story. So can you speak a little bit about that? So, you know, you you gave this beautiful example of like let the garden overgrow let your let your creative expression overgrow but for those people who are like literally you know triggered into a panic attack at the thought of that <laughs> how might they how might they gently move through that and sort of nurture and hold themselves in the process yeah and i guess it's just for me it's about being playful and returning back to our inner child and, and being playful in nature, I really encourage playfulness brings on creativity. 
And when we play, we create. And that's what we did best when we were young. We played and we created. So I always invite people, the best thing I can recommend is just to play. And even if it's just kind of getting a bunch of leaves and throwing them up in the backyard and just watching them fall, or it might be, you know, digging around in your garden and finding little insects um, that might be buried underneath the, the soil or, you know, looking out for snails after it rains and counting how many you can find, doing yourself a little treasure hunt, you know, just play. Mm. Those are some lovely examples. And thank you for bringing that reminder of playfulness in because I think it's so easily forgotten. It goes back to our earlier conversation of what happens when creativity is taken away from us and also what happens when our play is kind of given a set structure and we're told what's acceptable play and what isn't acceptable play. I, I certainly, as you were sort of talking about, you know, going out and looking at the snails and playing, again, it reminded me how many of these practices were challenging for me at the beginning. But, you know, when I shared early, you said, oh, that's so common to come up in the, in the, thera in the therapeutic setting. What, what examples do you have where you might have, you know, a, com a, a sort of anonymous example where you might have worked with someone who's lacking that play and they might have had a real challenging journey at the start to bring that, that play in? How, how would you have held that journey? Yeah, I guess one of the first things especially is just being comfort, comfortable in nature and feeling safe in nature and you know, it's, oh, I don't have the right shoes on, or it might be, it's raining, I don't have a raincoat on, or we don't have umbrellas. So, you know, some of my sessions I do walk and talk therapy. And so if it's drizzling a little bit, oh, we need to go inside and do it in the clinic room. It's okay, like we can just put our hoods on and we can walk and talk. So it's those levels of discomfort for each person. So that's an example that someone yeah. would, you know, wanted to do the session inside rather than walk outside just because there was a little bit of drizzle because their comfort level was challenged about mm. what they're comfortable being in, feeling water, even though they might have had a coat on with a hood. So it's knowing people's boundaries and their comfort levels as well. Um, and the other thing is people thinking they're being silly. I work with sand trays and we work with miniatures and we do sand play therapy. And it's people get embarrassed thinking, oh, like this is what kids do. And so they're almost embarrassed to be a child again. And why are we embarrassed of that part of ourselves that's still in us? We never leave that part of ourselves, you know, because we are the whole self. We don't separate our identities based on our age. We are that part. And when I work in trauma, I'm really working with the child. I'm not working with the adult. So when a, someone comes to me and they're working with something, whether, um, you know, it's anxiety and, and a fear, and I say, when was the first time you experienced this feeling? And they, when I was three, what happened? And so I'm working with the three-year-old in a 56-year-old body. Mm. And so I'm, you know, that child, that person, our fears, our, our traumas are still within us. And that's what we're working with. So why can't we go back and use play like therapy with that part of the self if that's the child age of the trauma that's the key yeah really the key and and also as i was listening to you describe someone who might have that embarrassment towards being childish it, it often arises the way that we feel towards ourselves or towards a younger version of ourselves is is really what we were taught to feel. So we were taught to feel embarrassed about that younger self. 
So for me, what nature has really helped with is almost modeling. It models how it responds to me. Like I feel the way nature responds to me. And I, I don't feel nature being like, oh my God, you know, you're such a douchebag. Like, oh, <laughs> like I, you know, like I have to turn away because you're acting like such an idiot. Whereas that was often how I was responding to myself. So it's this real sense of like, I didn't know how to be with myself in any other way other than be ashamed of myself. But mm. when I listened and felt the way nature was responding to me, I was like, oh, finally, I'm getting a, I'm, I'm getting like an energetic download of how I can now be with myself. Absolutely. And when I work in nature therapy and I work with people with nature, um, I'm mainly a facilitator. Nature's the therapist. So I facilitate the connection between the person and nature. Nature's the therapist and nature's the teacher. I'm the facilitator. I no longer become the therapist and or nature's co-therapist, depending on what work you're doing. But, you know, nature doesn't judge. Nature doesn't look at you and, and critique you or give you grades or tell you doing it right this way. Or, or nature doesn't ask us to change or rewrite things, does it? <laughs> and so and then when you look at nature and you look at trees and a forest do they do that to each other or do they support each other mm. does one tree look at the other tree and say oh your branch just fell off you're no longer a valid tree or you know you're moving too much you don't have enough you know stump on you that's why you're swaying too far like when, when you look at the reality of what things are, it seems ridiculous of how we behave as humans. And I question why we do this. Yes, it's an interesting, it's an interesting learning that we've, that we've taken on, like going back to your, you know, one of your first comments to say that we are nature and yet much of the way that we relate to ourselves and others isn't actually isn't natural isn't in accordance with nature I, I i i love everything that you shared i feel i feel like i've been given such a beautiful new perspective on that relationship between creativity and authenticity and that the creative act is just that act of of truth that that speaking from the soul so thank you so much for really kind of going with me on this on this conversation kit I'd love to just take a moment now because I know you do some amazing trainings. It might be that you want to speak about those or it might be that I didn't ask you a question. You know, we didn't go down a certain tangent that you were itching to go down or something's just popped up in the conversation today. So just it, anything that you want to reflect on or, or share as we bring this conversation to a close. Yeah, look, I guess in, in summarizing, it's just an invitation I think for everyone to start small and just mm. to notice I think the first step is to notice people can get overwhelmed again and critiquing themselves am I doing nature connection right and so that then becomes a barrier within itself those narratives again am mm. I doing it it's like meditation we have to close our eyes and hold our hands in a certain way and we need to breathe in and hold for four and breathe out for four and to scrap all of the expectations and just simply build relationship and just notice so you know next time you step outside your front door notice nature notice where nature is every time you're in your car and you're driving notice where nature is Notice the trees you're passing or the cloud formations next time you're outside or even clear night sky looking up to the stars. So nature can be accessed 24 seven, really. Mm. It's in us, it's all around us. And, and one thing I wanted to add that we didn't talk about, but we did was when we connect to our five senses, we connect to our sixth sense, which is our intuition. And our intuition is our authenticity and it's our inner knowing and to always honor that inner knowing and if it doesn't feel right then it isn't right 
You know, if you're going to mm. go to a publisher and, or you want to do something, if it's not feeling right, then it's not the right one. And mm. to sit and wait until it feels right, not thinking logically about what you should do, but does it feel right is something. And, yeah, if mm. people want to learn more about what I do, um, I do run a 12-month advanced accreditation in nature-based therapy. So I train people in nature-based connection work where you can learn processes to integrate into your practice or the practice of people you might be working with if you've got your own clients depending what you do um, that's coming up in September and I'm taking applications the great thing about that is it's basically offered internationally um, and it's available for all students whether you're within Australia or you're overseas as well and it's all done online um, and I have introduction workshops, which is just a four hour workshop if if you just want a snippet of, of what I want to do. But I love writing. I love blogging. So keep a lookout for my blogs that I put up on my website as well, naturebasedtherapy.com.au. Um, and I just, yeah, I think this has been a lovely conversation. I love sharing and talking about it. And thank you for the questions that you've asked. They've been really thought provoking. Mm. And it just kind of confirms why I do what I do. <laughs> oh, I know what you mean with that last point. That's such a lovely place to be in, isn't it? Yeah. And thank you for, for touching on that point of that sixth sense and if it doesn't feel right to wait and I will also add that sometimes that waiting can take some time I've been in real places where I've just been waiting and I've almost wanted to just give up because I'm like oh well the right feeling isn't coming therefore it's never going to come but often I find if I hold my nerve it it, it does come and the 12 month training brilliant and your four month ones they happen monthly don't they so, sorry, your four-hour ones. Yeah, they're monthly. every month. Yeah, they're yeah. every month. Brilliant. And I so we'll put all of those the, links. I t yeah, I tailor them to the seasons. Mm. That's something else we Perfect. didn't talk about is how do we work with the seasons? So before we finish up, I just want to say that we're in winter. Here in Australia, we're in winter. Yeah, yeah. And winter's about respite and rejuvenation and rest and slowing down. And it's shorter days, you know, and we move into spring and spring's about planting seeds and intentions. And summer is about enjoying those intentions that we've set because they're flourishing. And then autumn's mm. about letting go, letting go of our beliefs and our narratives and our habits and our expectations. Thank you for adding that bit about the seasons. Yes, because when you talked earlier about you came inside when the sun set and, and there was dinner, that you were living according to nature's clock, it, it really made me think about how often if we're on our devices, if we're, we're, we're living according to perhaps what those kind of electronic watches are telling us, this sort of very strange disconnect where we might wake up in the morning and, and we check our watch to see how well we slept rather than wake up in the morning and think, how do I feel? Mm. How do I feel like I slept? And, and also, I, you know, for me in the winter, my practices, they are completely different to the way that my practices are in the summer. And so really sort of creatively, I do fluctuate through the year and I know that certain practices work better at certain times of year. So I'm really glad that you added that bit about the seasons, Kit. Thank you so much for talking to me today. Thank you so much for joining me. I've really loved chatting with you. Yeah, it's been wonderful. Thanks for inviting me to share.